Hey everyone, my name is Gopika and today I'll be speaking about how to be a B2B product manager. Before I jump straight into the topic, let me give you a very quick um, overview into my background. So I'm originally from India. I've lived, uh, studied and worked across Italy, the United States, Spain and Berlin, Germany, where I'm currently based out of. I've built products for companies such as Zalando, Wayfair, Festo, um, Hungary and PopExo. Um, and my background is primarily in business. I studied a master's in innovation and entrepreneurship at Asade Business and Law School in Barcelona. So let's jump straight into the topic, which is how to be a B2B product manager. Over the next um, minutes or hours, um, we'll be covering a few main topics that um, fall within how to become a B2B product manager. Firstly, I'll take you through the differences between B2B and B2C product management, the essential skills that is required to exceed or be successful in a role such as this. And lastly, I'll take you through some of the common fit pitfalls that's more common, uh, in my opinion, in B2B product management as well. So this talk is for someone who either wants to move from B2C product management to more B2B, um, as well as someone who's completely new to the field of product and wants to get their um, hands dirty in this field. So let's look at this image first, which basically is the same, whether you're building products for B2C or B2B. You have a vision, you have the strategy that you need to apply to achieve that vision. And lastly, you have a product manager trying to navigate through all the possible ways to reach that vision. So no matter what the sector, we use the same tools and frameworks to build and ship products. So we all follow the 4D processes as though it's a Bible. We use um, many such frameworks, such as Amazon's Thinking Backwards framework to communicate, discuss, and gain alignment. And lastly, we um, keep users at the center of all our decision making. Um, and although there is a massive overlap between these two kinds of product management, few areas have a much um, higher focus, depending on whether you're building for businesses or for end customers. So let's jump straight into the first subtopic, which is the key differences between B2B and B2C. So as mentioned, um, the underlying process of building or working with both these kinds of products is largely the same. But based on my experience, I have noticed some key differences between when you build products for businesses or customers. One of the main um, areas that I've seen this difference lie in, uh, firstly, is in the way that we build personas. So in B2B and B2C, personas are designed a little differently from each other. In B2C, you must focus on the person as an individual. So you look at things like age, um, gender, income, hobbies, etc and how, how um, they spend their time, where they're located, and so on. Whereas in B2B, it's more about the organization and the company. So you look at things like, um, for how long has this company been established? What are the capabilities of this company? What's the department size? Um, what products are they specialized in? Are they a single uh, product brand, a multi-product brand, um, and so on? And especially for B2B, the end uh, user and the consumer is quite different from the buyer. So it's, it actually gets tricky. You're building for someone 
who might not actually pay for the product at someone else. So it actually requires a lot more conscious effort to build up empathy with, with customers and users in the B2B space. The second main difference that I've seen between these two types of product management is in the product experience. So for consumer products, success is typically measured about getting users to love your product. But when you look at an enterprise setting, the buyer and um, the user, as I mentioned, is different personas. So for enterprise products, success is about enabling your end users to deliver more value to their business by using your product. Um, I've also noticed in, in B2B setting, improving workflow um, efficiency is far more uh, important than um, just better user experience. And almost always building new features takes priority over improving existing user experience. And lastly, I've seen something that's uh, quite unique in the B2B setting is your strong relationship with the sales team. So we all know that one of uh, product managers main um, job is to gain alignment with multiple stakeholders. But um, in the B2B setting, one of your key stakeholders um, as a product manager is to really um, be very much aligned with what um, with, with the sales team. So uh, consumer products rely on marketing and advertising and word of mouth. And B2B, um, the main tool is the salespeople. So they need to think about, us as PMs need to think about the sales uh, team as just another customer. So if the sales team is, say, going to make more money, we need to think about how we can help them um, achieve that goal. Uh, we also need to make sure the value proposition that we're building um, for is the same thing that the sales team is communicating to the end users while they're selling it. Um, and as product managers, one of the main things uh, you need to do uh, in order to better this relationship with the sales team is to understand the sales process understand how leads are generated and move through the pipeline um, and also understand this valuable information that the sales teams are getting from the end users since they're in such direct contact with them. So it's, it's definitely one of, one of the really um, important points or important things to note while working in a B2B setting, in a B2B setting that you will notice this stakeholder being far more, like has a far more weight than, than your other stakeholders. So um, now that we've spoken about the key differences between products in a B2B and a B2C setting, let's jump straight into the key skills required to excel in this role. Um, the first one is understanding your user base. And while it sounds very, very uh, simple and straightforward, um, as you can recall, in a B2B setting, you're not learning about a person, but about a business. So you need to learn and cohort users based on different aspects of how they run the business. So let me give you an example here. At one of the companies that um, I was working at, we were developing a supplier tooling product uh, for brands that are selling on our uh, platform. So one of the ways that we use to segment our users is by the resources they have. Um, and the reason uh, when I say resources, it means their internal capabilities and we segmented companies based on the internal capabilities. And the reason is because we didn't want to deliver a product that's beyond their capabilities. So we didn't want to deliver a product that's nice to look at, but it's not helpful when put to use because the end users didn't have the knowledge or the know-how to use the specific product. Um, so 
you can take other you can take other ways to cohort your product or your uh, sorry your users so one is through revenue um you can also look at their organizational structure how is their organization team uh, how's their org structure divided is it based on are people focusing on specific countries are people specific um focusing on specific categories because these insights will help you deliver and build your product even better because you will design your product based on their business structures um so understanding and really segmenting your user base um is is quite uh actually one of the most important factors in um a b2b setting so let's move on to the second main skill that's required for a pm to excel in a b2b setting so usually um in the b2c case the intersection that a product management uh, a product manager works in is the intersection of business engineering uh, user experience um research and so on but in a b2b case especially if you're working with a data or a dashboard product what's really necessary is to have this domain knowledge about data and data science um let's take an example so let's imagine you're building a dashboard product that depicts the performance of a customer's business through interactive um visualization sounds easy right um you just have a few numbers a chart um uh, you don't really you don't really need much but what um uh, what's what a pm needs to know is that it's not just about um the data and some building a chart but you need to understand the close proximity between design and data infrastructure so um the way you design and visualize um a chart or a table dictates how the infrastructure is built whether you need a single table multiple tables how are the interactions between the tables and so on so a pm in this field needs to ha- do have a deep appreciation for what is possible and what will be soon be possible if they were to take the full advantage of the flow of data um if you're building and this is specifically for someone building a data product uh you need to know um and learn that building products with data also requires a data strategy um and this is above what a business strategy is so a data strategy is the way and your plan um uh that you develop to understand how data is generated how data can be used to improve the product um and and also um use this in your products um and uh, also use data um to improve your products long term success so in other words um a data product manager or a product manager working with data and dashboard products makes decisions that get the flywheel moving with data um while you don't need to understand the nitty gritty details um and and technicalities um what is helpful in a really a collaborative discussion with your uh, backend engineers or data engineers is to learn and know the know-how of what kind of infrastructure is required to support the product and what is the complexity and costs associated with scaling the data um and yes data scientists or engineers will always be around to answer your questions but again in order to be an active participant in these discussions um and to also understand the trade offs you make um by making one decision uh involving data versus the other um learning about the infrastructure and learning about the trade offs will help you um develop better in this role So that's uh the second most important and critical skill that a product manager in this field needs to have. Lastly, it is as we mentioned uh right at the beginning of this talk um about the relationship with the sales team. So that's one skill that a product manager working in the B2B space needs to really um 
work towards improving. Um, as I mentioned, the sales team is literally the most invaluable source of information since, and this is the sales, this is your account managers, um, anyone who is in direct contact with the partners or with your um, end users um, can really help you understand their, their needs and their problems. And they can also help you in highlighting what you could build next. So something that a product manager in this field should not fall prey to is just building things that come across in, in these feedback. So there could be multiple times where um, key account manager or someone from the commercial teams can tell you that, hey, why don't you build this? It might add value to um, our user. Um, and I think what's... Um, What's a skill that a product manager needs to have is to understand sh uh, is not to build something um, as and when they come in, in the form of feedback, but actually learn about the underlying problem that the current product is currently not solving and then decide whether a scalable solution is required um, to answer these unaddressed uh, problems. Um, and that's the reason, um, especially with when you're interacting with the sales team or commercial teams, there needs to be not only the sort of exchange, but also prioritization and a deeper and a second level of research um, that needs to be taken up after these discussions. Because a lot of these conversations might be in the form of um, a solution um, and not a problem. And that's where a product manager needs to dive deep into and learn about the problems instead of um, going straight ahead into solution mode. So um, lastly is something that I just touched upon, um, but I want to go deeper into it, which is prioritization and expectation management, um, which comes also with um, having um, business and enterprise customers and working with the sales team. So something that might um, come about in a B2B setting is um, you can get requests from both the sales team as well as your existing customers. While this is also true um, for B2C products, the key difference again is that B2B products have fewer customers and there could be a chance where these few customers actually generate a lot of revenue and have a lot of weight in what you build. So um, something that you need to understand is, yes, these, these specific customers may have um, more weight than your other customers in terms of the revenue they make or the relationship that they have with your team. But something that you also need to know is weigh this against what you're building. So are what, is what you're building um, specific to that one customer? Um, you also need to think if you customize your product heavily to that one customer, how can this product scale to the other customers that are using your, your tool or your product? So it is a key challenge for product managers in the B2B context to navigate this fine line between um, keeping your customers happy, uh, generating enough revenue, and building features that are, that are scalable to all users or most users to your product. Um, secondly, what I want to touch upon is expectation management. So, um, Something that uh, is very, very um, noticeable in a B2B setting is that your sales team wants to have a um, high level visibility on your, uh, or want to have um, a lot of visibility into your roadmap. So um, we do know that roadmap is something that changes uh, quarterly or six months. But um, sometimes the sales and even the end customers want to understand um, what you're building and are you building for things that are um, being requested for. Um, so 
I think what we need to navigate as a product manager is this line between enough visibility for customers and sales team and also the flexibility to be able to deliver the highest value product and killing those ideas that fail to deliver the value on the other hand. So you need to somehow make and and um, constantly communicate with your end customers and your sales team um, by, by uh, every time there is a change in your roadmap, every time you do go a different direction, um, communication uh, is key to, to manage um, the stakeholders' expectation. Um, so that's one of the key uh, skills that a product manager needs to develop in this uh, working in this sector or in this segment. So now, lastly, it brings us to our last segment, which is the common pitfalls that a product manager in this um, setting um, falls to. Um, and while this is very much true for also B2C products, the reason why I've highlighted in, in this B2B space is because it costs you more. So um, by if you if you fall to one of um, these these problems, and if you fall prey to one of these problems, um, you're not only losing customers, or you're not only losing the few handful customers um, that you have, but you're also spending resources that you may or may not have um, in order to build these. So um, let's move on to the first one, which is aimless exploration. So what uh, I've highlighted here is in the beginning, I took you through how there are a million paths that a product manager can take to get to the vision. Um, but what could happen is you don't know where to begin, especially if it's a new product, especially if it's a new feature. So sometimes what product managers end up doing is just um, they just take up um, random discovery. So you just go ahead and say that I'm going to interview a bunch of uh, um, users or partners and see what comes up in the discussion and take it from there. So um, that's one of the common uh, pitfalls that um, I've noticed in this field. Um, something that, uh, and let's, let's make this more concrete for an example. So let's say you want to, or your goal as your product vision is to increase um, revenue streams through advertising. Um, and what I've seen product managers do is just go out there, interview um, your users and understand how can we generate revenue through advertising. There are a bunch of different ideas um, that um, the PMs want to test. And um, yeah, it, it, it has no purpose and it has no um, clear direction on how much or how likely is this idea going to um, contribute to achieving this vision. So what's the solution to that? So the solution to that is instead of, um, instead of wandering aimlessly, uh, you need to wander with purpose. And what that means is um, before you jump straight into solutions and before you jump straight into discovery, you need to break this higher vision down into themes. So what you're now doing is saying, yes, my product and vision is to generate revenue through advertising. And instead of aimlessly going forward and testing and throwing a bunch of ideas to your users, what you can do is first segment them based on themes and then select a theme that you want to validate and dis or discover further in. So in this case, what we've done is instead of looking at a bunch of ideas, we are now saying, hey, yes, we can generate revenue through advertising through data-driven insights, through alerts, or through recommendations. And now how you're going to um, start your discovery work and your research work is by picking one theme and then moving that forward in the discovery stage. So you know that 
you're moving um, with a specific goal in mind, with a specific team in mind, um, and you're not like all the noise is canceled out. Something that you can do even uh, better is not only um, choose a theme and validate and test a theme, but combine it with personas in order to be even more, um, uh, to wander even more with purpose. So what we've done here is that we're saying that, let's take this example. We're saying that we want to understand how can insights contribute to generating um, advertising revenue? And we believe that there are certain types of personas that will help us generate this revenue if they did use insights. So then during your interview process and your discovery process, um, you specifically look at this target group and validate this problem with that target group before going and, and building something. So what this does is it strengthens your uh, discovery work and your eventual 4D work. Um, and you're not wandering aimlessly. You're not wasting resources trying to find an idea that might work, but you're putting, uh, you're developing a framework. You are um, segmenting uh, the bigger idea into smaller chunks that you want to test and then testing it with the relevant um, user group. So that's one way to solve this. Let's move on to the second problem that I have noticed is um, it's a sunk cost illusion. So it mostly happens when you have um, shipped a product uh, without uh, great traction, um, but you continue building on it because um, you think that by building or making it nicer or prettier, um, uh, the product that's not working, you might um, gain more uh, customers or you might improve the engagement and so on. Um, the solution to this is, um, it's very simple. It's basically slowing down. Um, what that means is instead of going and sending out additional emails, communication emails to your users, instead of um, improving the UI, UX, or um, just building complementary features that you think might improve the product, what you need to do is ask yourself some devilishly simple questions. And these are mostly, what is your value proposition of the product? What, are, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Who is it that you're trying to solve the problem for? Um, is someone, how are um, your end users currently solving this problem. Um, so especially for this question, you would know that if your current um, business users are not doing much to really solve the problem, it might not be a real problem versus if your um, end users are stitching together a bunch of things and trying to make it work for them, you know that this is a problem to solve because they take a lot of time and energy during their day to make it um, uh, like make it work for them. So there are these certain questions that you need to ask yourself, which is the basic questions before you go and um, uh, build further upon, upon the feature that you've uh, delivered. Um, and if you then do find out the answers and if you do, um, believe that you're not building for a certain target group or if you're not building the right product, what you need to do is pivot instead of um, moving even um, further down the product development process. So let's move on to the last common um, pitfall, which is biases. So what this means is a bias is basically um, misinterpreting or skewing the signals for validation. So let's take this example here. Um, this was this is a real life example. Um, so at one of the companies that I was working at, um, we were tracking the engagement um, and the activation rate of the different users that were using our product. Um, I got so excited by active users that I ignored 
the remaining users. So what I did was looked at active users constantly, looked at uh, the growth in revenue that they were generating, how often they were coming back. And what I didn't see is this chunk of users or this cohort of users that were actually going, um, that were actually declining in engagement and in adoption. Um, I spotted this at the right time. And when I tried to figure out how to solve a problem such as this, um, I realized or I learned that cohorting is one of the best ways to solve this problem. So what you do in um, by cohorting is instead of asking yourself what's going well, you ask yourself what's declining. So when you look at um, um, graphs such as this, you see the yellow spots um, and you ask yourself what's going, um, what's going there and you go further into it. So uh, let me give you a more concrete example. So let's say you have um, 100 users and 50 of those users are underperforming. Um, what you do is then segment these users into um, a cohort such as when was the first time they logged into the tool, secondly, how much revenue are they generating, Third, um, the third point, do they have any internal capabilities? So when you segment these users into different segments, uh, what you then do, and do is spot the segment that's declining. So then you can approach those specific uh, users. Let's say the user that's generating less than a certain amount of revenue and do not have more than two employees at their company uh, is causing the decline. So what you then do is approach those um, uh, users uh, for a post rollout feedback and dig deeper into what is um, not helping them. So what are the things that would provide them value that you're not providing them value with? So that's one of the best ways to um, not fall into bias is to consistently question what's not going well um and uh, then go deeper into into that problem um the second way to not fall into this bias or the survivorship bias is oh, uh, considering by considering product management as a team sport and this was actually one of the best advices that was given to me um by a mentor and um i was told um, that if you do consider product manager as a team sport and not something that you do at an individual level, you take self-worth and uh, the idea um, that's originally one, one element and you split them into two. So you decouple self-worth and idea. So if an idea fails, it's, it's not just you that uh, led to its failure. It's a bunch of people. So you wouldn't fall uh, prey to um, cognitive biases or survivorship biases. So um, involve as many people as you can in the ideation phase, in the validation phase, in the feedback phase. Um, and that's, that's one way to not uh, to detach self-worth and, and the idea. Um, so I guess that was a little uh, intro or a little package to um, uh, getting started into B2B product management and something that you can expect um, by going into this field. I hope that uh, it, it helped you gain an insight into this area. And um, yes, thank you all for tuning in. And I'm happy to answer any questions either via LinkedIn or via um, this, this uh, talks chat. So thank you. And um, have a great rest of the week.